So uh, I appreciate you guys coming today. Um, I chose the topic or the title for this, Teach Me How, and I probably should have italicized this, Teach Me How I Learn, Talk How I Communicate. And the reason that I did that is um, because really the most effective communicators are those that will adapt their style or adapt their mode of communication to those that they're talking to. Um, and so that's why I chose that, this, uh, this title for this uh, discussion about uh, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learning and communicating. So uh, I want to just play this short little video. Do you ever feel like this when you're communicating with somebody? Oh, my word. Where's the audio? <laughs> See, that's what I get. This shows that it's up. Well, I don't know what to tell you. But it's the Charlie Brown thing that, where uh, they're sitting there and the teacher's going, wah, 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 wah. And do you ever feel like when you're talking to somebody, you can look at them and you see that in their mind they're going, wah, 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 wah. And you feel like no matter what you do, you're just not making a connection. As hard as you try, you're just not connecting or communicating with them. Well, uh, as you know, this is my, as you probably are aware, why is this not working? Um, all of my, the leader shops that I have done so far, well, the only ones I've done, have had one common theme, and that's to help us to become better communicators um, with each other because that helps to alleviate problems, helps to alleviate uh, miscommunications. And so what is it that we're really trying to do when we communicate with somebody? Throw it out there. I mean, I know these are things up there, but what are, what's your feelings about what we're trying to do when we're communicating something? Understanding. Understanding, okay. Um, that really is the biggest thing, is understanding, and we're going to actually talk about that uh, quite a bit in this. But we're typically trying to share information. We're trying to learn information. We're trying to build friendships or relationships either through business or through work or through home or just friendships, whatever. Um, and when we communicate, we're trying to build those relationships. We're trying to express feelings and ideas and we're trying to understand others' feelings and ideas. In other words, really, communication is about influence. It's about how we're influenced by our communication and it's about how we influence others. And as I said at the beginning, the most effective communicators, the ones that can influence the most and be influenced the most, are those that are willing to adapt and not get so hung up on their point of view and the way that they communicate. And so that's um, the purpose of this little uh, discussion today. So um, if you remember from my first... Uh, I, I want to review this because it has a lot to do today with what we're talking about, but if you remember from my first presentation... Um, what percent of our communication really is verbal? Well, 50% is body language, for example. What does that say? Do I have to say a word? If I'm standing here like this, what do most of you understand that to be? Or, or body language is 50% of really how we communicate then 43% of it is our voice, our tone. It's how we say things. And you think about that. I, I know I've used this example, but you could go to another country that does not speak English, and you could ask them a question, and you could say something as silly as, oh, aren't, you, aren't your people just the biggest knotheads? I can't stand them. And if you're doing it with the right tone, oh, thank you, thank you very much. Oh, you know, they're going to, because it's your tone. It's how you say it. Um, and then finally, it's words. It's 7% words. So really, 93% of our communication happens at a subconscious or unconscious level. 93% of it. Only 7% is words. So what that tells us, if we want to be better communicators, we need to better understand this 93% right here because sometimes we think in our minds we place too much emphasis on our words. How many times have you been in a conversation where to you, it's very clear what you're saying? And you even think, I've really discovered this now that I'm teaching full time, that I'm trying to 
tone it down. I'm trying to water it down to make it simple. And they don't still, still don't be, seem to be getting it. Do you ever feel like that? That's because we're focusing primarily on our, on our words. And we need to just look at the differences in how they're receiving it and communicating. So um, I'm going to preface this with it's not what you say, but it's more about how you say it. And so I, that's what we're going to discuss today. So to start out, I'm going to just, we're going to, if you have a piece of paper, if you want, if you're taking some notes, you can just take this little test with me, some very simple things, um, and then we're going to discuss this. So if you were on the phone with somebody and where they couldn't see this, where, how, how would, or if you were just communicating with somebody, how would you describe this scene to someone? Think in your mind the way that you would describe it. You can write down some words, whatever. But think for a minute, how would you describe this scene? Think particularly about your choice of words, the details. What is it that you would share? Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm going to give you a scenario. You want to buy a new car. Which response, and I want you to pick the one that's most likely. I know that there's not going to be one response that's going to be what everyone would do but, or what you might do, but one that you'd be most likely to pick. You want to buy a new car. Which response is likely the primary way which you would approach this pur pur purchase? A, I want a car that's stylish and sporty. It has to look good, and I want to look good in it. B, just the facts, ma'am. I want to know all about the safety ratings, the mile miles per gallon, any recall issues, I want the facts. Or C, I want to sit inside the car, I want to see how it's, I want to see how it feels, I want to know how it smells. This has to be comfortable. What would you most likely choose? And you can just pick A, B, or C, and then we'll talk about this again in a minute. Scenario number two, you've now purchased that car, and now and you're pretty excited about it. Now you have to go home and convince your spouse or your significant other why you purchased this. How are you more likely to discuss this with your spouse? A, hey, come and look at this car. It looks so good in our driveway, and you will really fit this car. It just looks like you. It fits you. And then you give very brief and direct points about it. Or B, oh my gosh, come on, let's go for a ride. I feel so alive when I'm in this car. The acceleration and the wind in your hair is amazing. I just love how it smells. Or would you do C, you would explain how reliable it is compared to the other, other similar vehicles of its class, how cheap it is on insurance and gas, on its safety rating, what its mile per gallon is, and you'll go on and on and on about the facts and the statistics. A, B, or C. Scenario number three. Someone asks you if you have a pet and they want to know about him. How would you most likely describe your pet to them? Oh, Ranger is so cute, and I love it when he runs up to me, and when I get home and he wants to play with me, he wants me to pet him and play with him. I love it when he sits or lays right next to me. B, I have a German Shepherd. He's two years old. He's about 32 inches tall and weighs 70 pounds. He has dark brown and sable markings, and his name is Ranger. Or C, I have a German Shepherd. His name is Ranger. How would you be more likely to answer that question about your pet? And finally, number four, you've just had a disagreement with somebody and they are angry. You really care about them and you really want to try to understand their stance, their point of view. How would you most likely follow up? A, I'm not really sure how I feel about that, but it's clear you feel strongly about this. B, I'm trying to see your point of view, but I have a hard time seeing eye to eye with you. It looks like you're upset though. Or, or C, I hear what you're saying, but can I ask you some more questions to help explain this? It just sounds like you're really angry about this, and I'm not sure why. A, B, or C. So let's talk about this. The photo, um, what kind of words do you, did you use? Were they descriptive? Were they factual? Were they feeling? How it makes you feel? Um, what kind of words did you use? Scene A, which was getting ready to purchase the car, or scene one, if you picked A, you're probably more likely a visual person, B, an auditory, or C, a kinesthetic. Scene two, now you've bought the car. How do you explain it to your spouse? If you picked A, you're probably more of a visual person, B, you're kinesthetic, 
and see you're more auditory. Scene three, somebody asks you about your pet. If you picked A, the way you would describe it, you're more kinesthetic. B, you're probably more auditory. Or C, you're more visual. Scene four, or scenario four, and I did put scene, huh? Um, scenario four, uh, you're, the argument, and you're trying to understand them. Did you pick A? Then you're probably more kinesthetic. B, more visual, or C, auditory. So what does this really mean? What does this have to do with anything? You're going to find that, you know, there's lots of different ways that people talk about how we communicate with each other through, color, you know, the color scheme or um, our love languages or there's so many different things. But um, communicating through VAC or visual, auditory, and kinesthetic understanding is just one of many ways that we can use to help us better understand who we're communicating with and how we can reach them at their level. And so um, what VAC, stand, or VAC stands for visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, and it's a method that explains how people interpret the world around them, how they perceive and understand it, and then therefore that affects how they communicate. The way that we perceive is the way that we com per, uh, communicate. So visual people, that's 38% of the population. That's the biggest part, the biggest part of the population. And 38% of the population, they say, are visual, are those who primarily use vision and the things that they see to interpret the world and make decisions. Next is auditory. They're the, they're the minority in the, in the world. They're 28% of the population. And auditory people are those who interpret everything around them with their hearing and, they, and their senses, and they depend largely on spoken words and sound for their learning. They attribute lots of things to sound and repetition. And then finally, kinesthetic, that's 34% of the population. And those are those who, who just feel their way through life. They judge everything based on their feeling, on how it makes them feel, on the emotions that it invokes, and that's how they react much to their world. Now, all of us will have primarily a, a predominant one of these, visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. Some of us may be close to another one. We may have a little bit of mix of both, but all of us will usually show, will typically show one dominant style of the way that we learn and communicate. So what I want to do right now is I want to spend the rest of the time just talking about the differences between these three styles, and then if we need to communicate with them, how we do that more effectively. So the first thing we'll talk about is just some, some uh, Oh, you know what? I lied. Why is this important? Okay, um, Because as was said, it, uh, look, communicating means understanding. And if we want to influence others or be influenced, then there has to be understanding. So if we understand others, that means that we'll be able to walk in their shoes. We'll be able to join them. And this is really what this is about, is joining them. Not just trying to understand them, but joining them in their percep perception so that we can recognize and appreciate their feelings and ideas. And I'll tell you that when we can learn to recognize and appreciate, that doesn't mean we always have to agree with, but when we can recognize and appreciate their feelings, ideas, and perspectives, we will become master communicators. Because people don't, it's like that old saying, they don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. And so really, we're trying to learn how to recognize and appreciate so we can understand. Why does this work? Well, most of the world, most of us operate from our own perceptions and on our own experiences to interpret everything that goes on around us. So if we can learn to step outside of that and see others the way they perceive it or understand, we're going to build rapport with them. Um, that, doing that builds that trust and rapport and it opens lines of communication because they feel like they were, that we're genuinely interested. And misunderstandings are far less likely if we will be willing to learn to talk the way they talk and learn, uh, teach the way they learn. And uh, m misunderstandings are a lot less likely. So what it comes right down to it, when we speak their language, we can become influential. And it's not that we're, it's about us influencing them to our way, because some of the most influential people are those that will listen to others' ways and see their point of view and then try to adapt that. So it's not about us trying to exert some kind of power or influence. It's about us trying to use influence to become better communicators and understand people better. So let's talk about visual communicators. Visual communicators. 
And as we're going through this, try to imagine maybe what kind of person that you are primarily. And at the end, I'll give you some websites where you can actually take tests to determine that. But visual communicators, typically, if they're standing or sitting, they're upright, they're erect. Um, if they're sitting, they're going to be the ones that are sitting up like this. Eyes are forward. Usually, if they're talking to a group, they're going to be looking over their heads a little bit. And they may have their hands folded, but their arms are going to be typically a little bit open like this. Okay, that's visual people. Um, they are the show me type. They want you to show them how to do something, how to accomplish something. They like that. Um, they like the statistics and the and the facts and the um, those things that just make it very clear. Um, when they're thinking, you'll watch people that are um, visual. They'll have a tendency to rub their eyebrow to be rubbing right by their eye or the bridge of their nose like this. Though when, when uh, visual people are thinking or processing what you're telling them, that's typically how they'll, uh, their, st their stance will be or their, uh, where they'll be touching themselves. They tend to breathe nice and even. Even if they're upset, they tend to breathe nice and even. And if they're upset, they'll just look right past you. It's like staring through you you'll know that they're listening or that they're there, but it's like they're just glaring right through you. That tend, those are visual communicators. Um, they tend to use words that convey vision. They say things like, I see your point of view, or that looks good, or this is giving me a glimpse of the potential we have for this, or it's pretty plain to me, or things that are clear, or I imagine. Um, they'll use these words that have a tendency to be more visual in nature. And then here's the thing with visual people. They are very short and sweet. They want just the absolute facts they need to know. They get really irritated if somebody rambles on. Even if it's a loved one, they tend to shut them out. They tend to tune them out. They don't want to hear anymore. Once they've heard what they need to do to get on with it, they're ready to get on with it and they've shut them out and they're starting to think about what they need to do. So even if it's a loved one, they're, they get, tend to be very short and concise. They just want to get on with it. Okay, that's uh, visual learners or, and communicators. Here's some other things about visual communicators. Their clothes are typically very clean, very pressed, and they are, it's very important that they match, that everything's in its nice little place. They're very good about remembering faces, but typically have a hard time remembering names. Visual communicators are fantastic note takers, and they take meticulous notes details. Um, they're very good note takers, and so they do very good in situations where they're required to do that, and they do very good in learning that way. Um, if there's a pen close by and you're talking to them, especially in a tense situation, that pen will lay flat right in front of them, and they will never touch it. Okay? Um, they are very organized and very self-motivated. They're very results and growth oriented, and as a result of that, because they're like when they get short and concise, they want the details and to move on. Sometimes people look at them as, man, they're just cold and they're uncaring and they're, all they want to do is just get on with it. They don't want to listen or have anything to do with me. So they come across sometimes as very blunt. And one of the things that is very discordant to visual people, they see things in nice, even lines. Visual people do not like messes. It drives them crazy. Okay. Um, so how do we talk to visual communicators? One of the most effective ways to talk to them is to recognize this one thing right here. They want distance. Visual communicators do not like you to be in their space. So when you have identified somebody as a visual communicator, you need to respect that and give them their space. The reason being is when they're perceiving things, they want to be back far enough that they can see all of you and what's around you in the immediate area. So if if you want to drive a, make somebody discordant that's a visual, get right up to them and you'll, you'll end communication right there. That's very important, especially for visual people. Um, make sure that the area is neat and tidy. If you have to bring them in to talk to them and you want them to focus on you and, and on the message that you're trying to portray, make sure that area is neat and tidy. You bring a visual person into an office like mine is a little cluttered, uh, it'll drive them nuts. All they'll be able to do the whole time is looking at that clutter going, holy crap, that guy should clean, he should mess that up, he should clean that up, and they, so they won't pay attention to your uh, message. So you want to make sure that it's neat and tidy. 
Um, visual people, they like written instructions. They like the graphs. They like the visual stuff because they can interpret it better that way than just cold, hard numbers. They like those graphs. They like facts in the visual format. Phones drive them crazy. Now, I live with several visuals. This is exactly how they are. And if they have to communicate on the phone, it drives them nuts. And when they've been on the phone for 30 seconds, they're ready to get off. They would rather send a text because they can send it short and concise and then move on with their life. And when that person gets back, then they can respond in their time frame. They want to be very short and concise. A phone drives them crazy. That is, that is a big thing. So if you need to communicate with a visual person, try to do it face to face. They like that visual. Okay? Or try to do it... Uh, um, in a way other than by the phones, you know, with a, a, some kind of presentation or you're showing them something. They like to be shown their appreciation, shown with plaques, certificates, tangibles. It doesn't have to be in, in public. They don't like that, but they like something tangible that shows their accomplishments or, or that you appreciate them. When you're talking to them, be very conscientious about using visual words. Things like, I see if I see your point, oh, I realized I missed something there. If I see your point of view right, so you're restating it, let me show you what I mean. Um, I can visualize what you're trying to tell me. I catch that vision. Use those kinds of words because that's talking on their level. And be very concise and to the point. Do not ramble on. Get to the point and move on. Otherwise, you're going to lose them and they're going to start toning you out. Then another thing that's really important, and this is really for all of them, but match their posture. If you want to build rapport very quickly with somebody that you don't know, match and mimic their posture. And we're going to talk more about that later on and actually do some, you know, show you what that means. If you're talking to a visual person and they start to get frustrated, the number one best thing you can do is back up and give them space. They want that visual space. They want their protection zone. And if you're getting too close or things are getting tense, just back up and then redirect it with some visual words. Okay? That's talking to visual communicators. Um, the biggest thing to remember with them is they want their distance and they want it short, sweet, and to the point. Um, and they like to be shown their appreciation or your appreciation for them. Don't just tell them they want to be shown some way. Okay, that's a visual learner. So next is we're going to talk about some auditory communicators. This is how they tend to communicate during our communication process one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if they're standing or sitting, their arms are folded, their eyes are looking down and usually to the, to the side of whomever or whatever they're talking about. So their arms are folded and they're looking like this. Remember, the auditory is only 28% of the population. They're the smallest. And we've always been taught that when people are doing this, that they have shut down. But if you can identify that they're auditory, you have that person wrapped around your finger. They are listening to every word you have to say. If they have their arms folded, their face is down, they're looking down into the side of something, and they have an ear turned towards you, you've got their undivided attention. You keep talking because they're going to listen to you. Um, they want to hear details, comparisons, all the hard facts. They want all the details. As long as it takes, they'll sit there and listen because that, that's how they're processing things. Um, they tend to rub their ears or their cheek. When they're sitting at a table or when they're talking and you're really reaching them, they have a tendency to have their hands up by their face or by their ear. And, and that means that, that again, you, if you see that, that means you've got them. You're, they're listening to you. Um, they have a tendency to sigh. They breathe in big, full motions. They get their whole, when it says big, full motions, um, they do nice rhythmic and even melodious. If there's some sound going on, you'll notice that they'll start breathing to the tone, to the beat of that sound. But they'll be nice and melodious, real full breaths, and out, and out, and really get that chest going, and, and the shoulders, they're really getting that full motion. That's how a, an auditory communicator and when they sigh, that doesn't mean they're frustrated. That means they're listening and they're internalizing that. Um, so you need to, they like to use words that convey hearing. Like I heard what you said. I'm trying to listen to you. That sounds really good. Can you repeat that word for word so they can process it? Um, I'd like to voice an opinion. Things are loud and clear. I want to express these things that have a tendency to convey some kind of hearing mechanism. That's how they have a tendency to talk. They like details, and they will go on and on and on, if allowed, with details. A lot of times, they like to hear themselves talk, okay? So 
uh, sometimes they need to be redirected because they will go on and on. Speaking of redirected, it's time to click my, just, okay. Um, some other things. Matching, like with a visual, they want everything nice and neat. Matching is not really important. They just want it to look good, but it doesn't have to be perfectly matched, perfectly ironed. Um, they're very good about remembering names, but not faces. And, the, and uh, they learn by auditory repetition. You will hear auditory people, when they're trying to learn something, they will stand there and repeat it over and over again because that's how they learn and process it. If there's a pen close by and it'll click while they're sitting thinking, they'll be just like that. That's exactly what they'll do because that melodious little clicking is very soothing, very comforting. What happens if a, if a visual person hears that? Drives them stark raving crazy. So, but, a, but an auditory person, that rhythmic little clicking, that is very soothing to them. It helps them to relax and to breathe. So they'll, if they have a pen, and they're, especially if it's an uncomfortable situation, they'll click it because that's very relaxing to them. Um, they have a tendency to analyze everything. Everything you say is going to be taken analytically, and they're going to think to themselves, what do they mean by that? And they're going to ask a lot of questions about what did you mean by that. They uh, have a tendency to take on too much. They don't know how to say no. They, wanna just, they just say yes to everything. Um, they're not very organized visually, but things are very clear to them internally. And so sometimes you have to drag that out. They are very stubborn until facts prove otherwise, and then they're a little more willing to listen. Okay? These people have a tendency to be good speakers and tend to be very friendly, um, but that's because they like to hear themselves, right? And then, but the, here's the thing with them. Sounds are very discordant. If they're trying to concentrate, and there's some outside sound, even a bird, if they're really trying to concentrate, it drives them nuts. They'll put in earplugs, they'll shut a door, they'll do something so they can have that complete silence. Okay? So, if we need to talk to an auditory learner and communicator, here's what we need to do. We need to be close enough, not, don't have the space like a visual, but close enough within about an arm's length away that they can hear us, that they can process what they're saying, and that they can still feel a little bit of a connection without being too, too close where, it's, where you're touching. Okay? They like that little bit closer approach. Um, need to make sure that the door is closed so that there's no auditory distractions. And this applies in business settings and home, anything. If you have to talk to somebody that you know is an auditory learner, don't do it where there's distractions because you're not going to get their attention. Um, phone calls can, oh, well, they like the step-by-step -step instructions. They don't want the graphs. They want the cold, hard facts, go from step A to step B. They like, they're, they're the ones that do good with buying something, opening it up, and they don't look at the pictures. They read the little step-by-step -step number, okay? Um, they like those verbal directions. Uh, so if you can read it to them, a lot of times they'll do very well. These are people that, a lot of kids that, Maybe struggle taking tests, but if you can read the test to them, they'll do phenomenal. Um, that's our, our auditory learners. Um, phone calls can be very effective because they like that auditory uh, communication. They, want you, they like you to tell them that you appreciate them. They don't have to have the tangible, but you better give them very specific reasons why you appreciate them. I like how you did this, and you better give them specifics. You can't just say, I appreciate you, because they go, yeah, sure. But if you say, I appreciate how you helped that student do this and do something specific, now they've internalized it, and guess what? You're going to get that behavior over and over again. So be very specific. Um, use auditory words. I hear what you're saying. It sounds like you're upset. I'll describe this in detail. Just use those words that invoke that auditory response to them, and again, You'll get that. You'll get their attention. They like lots of details, comparisons, and facts. Tell them why. If you have to communicate something or if you're trying to get some buy-in, you need to give them the facts and tell them why. Give them the comparisons why this way is better than this way or why you think it is or why you want to hear their opinion based on these comparisons. You, if you'll do that, you'll have their attention. You need to match their posture and their tone and pace. Especially, this is important with, uh, with uh, visual learners, I mean auditory learners, match their tone and their pace. If they're talking really fast, you talk really fast. And then you can, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit too, but just match them because that, that auditory um, inclusion will help them to key in on, okay, I need to, and, and you can actually override that by doing that initially. 
And we'll, we'll talk again about that. And then again, sit and stand at some arm's length away so that they're, you're close enough that they know that you're, you care, but not so close that you're putting them in their, just their uncomfortable zone. Any questions then about auditory learners? Okay, so finally, um, our kinesthetic communicators. These are our touchy feelies, the ones that like the world, how it feels, and, and everything is just such a great experience. They, and these people, they have a tendency to be happy a lot. Sometimes it drives the visual and the auditory people crazy because they're so happy about the world around them. But the minute something goes wrong, they are the emotional drama queens. The whole world is coming down on them, but they're very easy to redirect. So um, when they're, I, I told you how, you know, visual people are sitting there with their hands like, you know, hands like this, erect. Um, auditory people are more just kind of sat back just a little bit like this. Well, let me show you how kinesthetic people sit. What's up? Teach me. They're very laid back, open body posture, sometimes like this, and or they're sitting there like this. They're very open posture, very charismatic, move a lot, um, fidgeting with their hands. Uh, that's, that is a kinesthetic. You can pick out kinesthetics just like that if, for several reasons, and you'll see as we start talking about this more and more. But they're very open stance. They care about how something makes them feel. They don't really care about the facts. They don't really care about that. They want to know how it makes them feel, and that's how they judge a lot of their decisions. They tend to rubber tap their, uh, tap their legs. They tend to you know, get real jittery. Or if they're talking to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, they'll get very close and they'll even touch your hand or your arm. And if it's another auditor or another kinesthetic, they're like, whew, all right, this is great. We're connecting. But if it's a visual or, a, or an auditory, that tends to be a little discordant because they don't like that touch. Okay? Um, they tend to breathe low in their abdomen. What that means is they're using their gut muscle. They're like... They're so relaxed. Everything's cool. Yeah, they're kind of breathy when they talk. They're just excited about life. Um, and they use their words that convey feelings. So much of how they communicate is about, it's just charismatic. It's how they feel about the world. I grasp that, that anything that has a, something to do with touch or feeling, hang in there. This is such a pain in the neck. They get into a heated argument. That's the way that they describe things. It's something that invokes a, a feeling. Okay, And so they like the touchy-feely stuff. So just, they use lots and lots of gestures and excitement. They're very charismatic. They can't sit still. People call them the ADDers, and really they're not. That's just their learning style. They're just excited, and they just want to, let's get this done, okay? Um, some other finer nuances of kinesthetic. Matching? <laughs> What's that? Kinesthetic people have the craziest colors, the bright colors. They don't necessarily have to match. They just want comfortable fabrics, fabrics that feel good on their skin. They want to be comfortable. So matching is not really that important. They will remember things that were done, not seen or heard. So if you want to reach them, do something for them. Um, and do something specific for them. They'll sit back and watch a scenario, and they'll remember all the little things that, ha that happened and not, maybe not remember so much of what was said or what was heard, but more how it made them feel as they watch this scenario unfold. If they have a pen close by while you're talking, by the time you're done, that pen's going to be taken apart and laying on the, on the table. It's going to be in pieces because, ooh, they, and you know what? They're brilliant at puzzles and putting things together like that, but they like to take them apart first, and then they'll be really good about putting them back together. They have a tendency to be a little bit overly emotional and dramatic about things. And so uh, we'll talk a bit, little bit about that. And they do a lot of learning by hands-on. They love that on-the-job training, that love, that hands-on stuff. They love that touchy-feely. And when it comes to messes, they're like, huh, messes? What messes? They don't see it. It doesn't bother them. Something that would bother a visual or an auditory, they look right over it like it doesn't even matter. They have a tendency to have messy rooms, messy cars, messy... It doesn't bother them because they're so focused on how everything feels that they, the, the visual or uh, discordance of that doesn't seem to bother them. Um, if you can get to their emotional level, they're very easy to convince or to get on your side. They're very helpful. Kinesthetic people are people people. They love people. They're very helpful. They're very sensitive to people's emotions and feelings, and they're usually very good uh, listeners. Um, 
but only for a short time a lot of times, unless they really are engaged. They are very, very flexible. If, if they have a plan for something they need to do that day and something goes awry, they're cool with it. They're like, oh, all right, we can just, we'll adapt, we'll overcome. A visual and an auditory, we're like, oh, I, I was supposed to be there at 1105, and you know, they can't take it. It drives them crazy. But kinesthetic, they're like, ha, oh, no worries, man. It'll all work out. It's good. They don't care. They're very flexible. Lots of activity, though, around them is very distracting. If they have to focus on something and there's lots of things going on, they'd rather be involved with everything else that's going on than sit there and focus. So that becomes very important when it comes time to talk to kinesthetic communicators. So talking to kinesthetic learners and communicators, it's very important that even if it makes you uncomfortable, if you're a visual or auditory, if you want to get connect with a kinesthetic person, you got to reach outside yourself a little bit and you got to get right up next to them. You got to be willing to sit knee to knee, um, touch their hand, touch their arm, handshake when you walk in the room and, and introduce yourself because that touch will, for kinesthetic people will create an instant connection. They will feel like, oh, this person really cares how I feel. So that's very important. Um, if you need to have a, and you really need to make sure you have their attention, Make sure that there's not a lot of stimulation and activity when talking to them because they're going to get very distracted. They want to be involved in everything. Okay? These people love public recognition. If you want them to repeat behavior, give them public recognition in front of everybody. It doesn't even have to be a plaque. Just say out loud, I really, it was so awesome what so and so did. And I love how, and do it in, a bunch, in front of a bunch of people. That little center of attention, them being in the limelight, man, you're going to feed that fire. They're going to do that over and over again. So kinesthetic people love the public recognition. They are very creative and very inventive, but they have to have guidelines because they'll go pew, way off on a tangent if you don't give them some guidelines. So when you want them to do a project, give them some guidelines, but allow enough flexibility for them to be creative and intuitive, and you'll get amazing results out of them. Um, when you're talking to them, use feeling words. I feel really good about your progress. Uh, you really seem to be in touch with what's going on around here. I'm very impressed, or I'll be in touch with you. If you have to do a follow-up, I'll be in touch. Instead of saying, I'll contact you, that's very cold and contact. Uh, you know, but if you say, I'll be in touch with you, now you're connecting with their feelings. Um, convince them with feelings. Don't get too hung up on facts. Talk about why they need to be engaged and, tr and why they need to f come along or whatever it is, but engage their feelings. And when you do that, then um, they'll come along. But here's one thing about them. When you're doing that, sometimes it's very easy for them to take the I'm a victim stance. But it's also very easy to redirect them when you start talking about feelings. So when you see them taking that victimization and when they're sitting kind of open and all of a sudden they're like, <laughs> if you'll redirect that, You'll get, they're very easy to redirect because they want to please. They're very eager to, to co cooperate and get along with everybody. Um, so when you're talking to them, be very enthusiastic. Match their posture, tone, and pace just like everyone else. And be close. When you're close to them, they feel connected. They'll want to do what you want them to do, or they'll want to listen to you, or they'll talk to you. If you need them to open up, it's not just about getting them to be influenced by you. It's about them being willing to open up and talk so you can work something out. So just get very close to them and use these words and, and you'll find that they'll be very uh, open to communication. And touchy-feely people, they'll shut down communication right away if you're just trying cold hard facts and, and things like that. It, it doesn't take that. It takes just the feeling stuff. It just takes showing them that you care, that touch and that the, uh, being enthusiastic or, or uh, very appreciative then they're going to come along very quickly. So with all of them, um, it's very critical, all three of these, this is one of the kind of the points that's very, uh, very important with communication is we need to reverse our butts. And you say, what? Reverse our butts? What is that? How often do we say, you know, I really appreciated that, Paul invited me to help him at Discovery Park, but it sure frustrated me that he only gave me two days' notice. Not that he's ever done that, okay? Or, I really like what you prepared, but man, you made a mess. Well, we need to reverse our butts, because when we say but, 
Everything before the but is forget, forgotten, right? We don't remember that. We focus on what happens after that because we feel like, oh, okay, here it comes. So we need to reverse our buts. Instead of saying that, saying, you know, Paul really did only give me two days' notice, but I really appreciated the opportunity to come and help out. Or I know that when my daughter, you know, or this is what I was referring to, I know that it makes a mess when she cooks, but man, I love her cooking, and I love how excited she gets, and I love how good it tastes. Reverse our butts. If you have to do something that somebody will perceive as negative, say that first because they will forget everything else that you've said if you don't do that. And we have a tendency to communicate in that way. I really appreciate this, but, or you did really good on this test, but they're not going to remember that part. So reverse the buts. This part you struggled with on the test, but man, you did great on this part. We need to reverse our buts and make sure that we're saying the positive thing after the but, because that's going to be what's remembered. Um, and then mimic and mirror. Um, I, when I was a, a police officer, I was told, and I feel like I was actually blessed with, but I was told by many people, if there was somebody that needed to be interviewed, I was asked often to be the one that would interview them um, because I found it easy to build rapport. Well, one of the things that I learned years ago was this mimic and mirror. And what that means is that you just ask them some simple questions. You know, you can find out if they're auditory, visual, or kinesthetic very quickly by just asking them to describe something. So where are you from? Oh, really? Do you have kids? Do you have a dog? And the way they describe it, you can figure out pretty quick and then watch eye movement. And, but anyways, then you can figure out, okay, I need to mimic and mirror their behavior. If they're sitting upright and erect and, and defiant, I need to kind of sit like that at first. If they're sitting all back casual and comfortable, I need to sit like that. And then as we start to interview and they get really uncomfortable and they start to close up, then I need to do that. And the reason that happens is that you, it's remember that most of our communication is on the unconscious level. And so when we mimic that or mirror that, they take that as unconsciously that this person is really paying attention to me, they care, and it helps them to relax and to communicate. During one of my classes, one of my uh, graduate classes, we did a, a social experiment. We tried this, I don't know how many times, a dozen times, but it worked every time. We sent certain people out of the classroom. They were given specific instructions to come and talk to, they, was gonna sit, they were told there's going to be two people in the room, and you're going to just go and d dialogue with them, tell them about something. I, I don't remember what they told them. One of the people that they were talking to, one of us was told, you mimic and mock everything that they do. If, they are, if they're sitting upright, you sit upright. If their hands are folded, you fold your hands. If their hands are down at their side, if they're tapping with their right hand, you tap with their right hand. You mimic and mirror everything that they do. The other person, they were told, just do anything opposite. Don't do that. 100% of the time, we did this, I don't know how many times we tried this. We even brought people from the outside that were said, hey, will you help us with this experiment? 100% of the time, within 30 seconds, the person that was dialoguing would turn and focus all their attention on the, purpose, the person that was mimicking and mirroring them. The one that was not, the, and they don't have to say anything. All we did was just mimic and mirror what they were doing. And as soon as we started doing that, it was an instant connection. They turned and they started focusing all their attention on, on us, and that's who they would talk to. Then they told us that they said, you're going to have a two and a half minute dialogue. That's how, what this is going to take. Um, on the last 30 seconds, I want you to stop mimicking them and the other person's going to start mimicking and mirroring. And remember, this person had no idea what was going on. So I thought, well, now we've had this two and a half, or this two minutes to build this rapport. There, that's not going to change. And I would venture to say 90 or 95 percent of the time in that 30 seconds, their attention now turned from me, or from the person that was initially mimicking them to the person that was now doing it, while the other just kind of went to the opposite stage. So I learned something very important there that when it comes time to really communicate with somebody, you want them to feel like you care, it's so much about our bo body language and our mimic and mirror. So I would just challenge you that it's, it, it, remember, it's not so much about what we say, it's how we do it. And uh, mimicking and mirroring is just a great way, a lot of times when I had to interview somebody or, I had to, or even a, a victim of something that was very upset, if I would mimic and mirror, they would just, they would open up, they would break down, they would be willing to share their their feelings or, or what happened. And even 
guys that had done something wrong and they didn't necessarily confess, but they would just open up so much more and they would give enough information that you could dig it out of them. And it was simply by just trying to mimic or mirror the way that they communicate. Um, not just with body language, but with the words we used and, the, and with how we communicate. So, um, I wish that we had time. I would love to have had time to give everybody a little test so you could figure out how you communicate or what your learning or communication style is. But here are several sites, and I'm sorry I don't have a handout to have them on there, where you can get online and take simple little quizzes that will help you to understand how you mimic and, or how you uh, um, communicate and learn. At the beginning of this semester, I had every one of my students take this one right here. I gave them credit for it. I said, the first assignment you're going to get is going to be a piece of cake. It's going to give you 20 points for taking that test. It's going to take you all of five minutes. And then I put on the grade book, right, my very first entry, A, V, or K, so I knew if they were auditory, visual, or kinesthetic. If I found that they were, that they're struggling with a, a concept, I will cater what I'm saying right to them. When they ask, if I can't grasp this, I'll quickly look, or, and after a while you get to figure out who they are, and then I will cater my dialogue to that visual or auditory or kinesthetic learning style that they have so that they can understand or get concepts. It's very effective, and like I said, there's tons of ways. There's color schemes, there's uh, uh, you know, love languages, but this is one of many things that I have just found, and I'll tell you why I feel so strongly or good about this. Um, I am the only person in my family that is auditory. I'm the only one. So I'm just like that statistically, I'm the, I'm the minority. And for the longest time, I had a hard time understanding why aren't they getting, why, why am I not clear? Why are they taking this the way that I'm not intending? And once I learned this, it has changed my family dynamics. I'm not kidding, it has changed. I have a son that has some special needs. He's very hard to communicate with. I figured out how to communicate with him because I do it his way now. And you know what? It has opened up amazing lines of communication. My wife and I are considerably better. We, we've always got along great, but she's a very visual learner and communicator. I'm a very auditory. So that created some discordance sometimes. So we sat down one time after I learned all this, and I tried for a couple weeks just to adapt my communication style to her without her knowing why. And it was amazing how it was like just, oh, he's listening to me. He gets it. And then I told her why. And we learned, we talked about the way we both communicate. It has been amazing, the change that it's made in us. So I feel, that I know that this stuff works, and I know um, that it can make a difference for you. I know that it can help us all to be better communicators. It's just one tool that we can use that will help us to better understand how to communicate with somebody on their level. And if we want to be better, more effective communicators and teachers, we have to learn to speak at their level, not ours. They don't care what our level is. They care what theirs is. And that's how we have to learn to communicate. I know that, this is, I know that it works. So I, I would just invite anyone to ask some questions about this if you have any. That's the end of my presentation. Any questions? No, but can you send us the PowerPoint? I can. Just send me a, an email if you want it, and I'll share it with you. So any other questions? Did, could you find, identify your primary learning style just by kind of listening to this? Do children in elementary school, do they adapt a, a style and they stay with it their whole life? Primarily. Primarily, uh, and there's some thought on, in fact, they've only found one group in the whole world, and they're called the Balts, somewhere in North Africa, I don't know, that don't, that they can't use these styles to, to teach them or to find out if they're, if they're communicating, if they're telling the truth or not by eyes, things like that. It's the balls, but even little kids, this is, it works on. They develop kind of a primary style that they like to interpret the world. And whether it's through their environment or just through some genetics or both, everybody has a predominant style. There are some people that are, have two styles that they're pretty close, but they're, um, they typically will find a predominant style. And so if you take this test, you might find that, hey, Um, I, I'm not really sure about that. That's a good question. I'll have to look that up for the next time because that, that's a good question. So my, my six-year-old girl tells me she's very kinesthetic. Is she ever going to become auditory? Or um, probably not. And <laughs> my youngest is very kinesthetic, very kinesthetic. 
And sometimes when I'm talking to her, she will, <laughs> you know, but all I have to do is it's, they're very easy to redirect if you praise them a little bit or if you, oh, I'm sorry, I, you know, I don't want you to, they're, but man, they are emotional, <laughs> you know, and I've always thought, oh, she'll grow out of that, meh, she hasn't. I, I do. I try to mix it up. I do a little bit of hands-on, a little bit of everything. And fortunately, some of my classes, I have predominantly one style, so it's fairly easy to do that. And then if there's just individuals in that, and like this is only my first semester teaching full-time, so this is really only the first time that I've integrated it into the classroom setting. But it, there's been a few times already where I'm going, okay, they're not getting, or they come to me and say, hey, I need to talk to you, I'm not getting this, so I look up real quick, okay, they're, they're visual, they're auditory, so I need to give them the, you know, the, the graphs and all that, and that's hard for me because I'm auditory. Graphs don't make sense to me, you know, but to them it does, and so I pull out a graph or I'll, or I'll make a pie chart that explains ratios, and, and then it's like, oh, oh, I get it now. So, yeah, you have to just adapt sometimes to, um, and, you, and I try to integrate a little bit of everything. Some class, some it's hard. Math, it's pretty hard to get touchy feely sometimes, but but there's ways. Okay, anything else? Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for your participation.